Very cool. All right. So now I'm delighted to welcome back our ataxia expert, Dr. Susan Perlman. Dr. Perlman is the clinical professor of neurology and director of the Ataxia Center at the UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles. Welcome, Dr. Perlman. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me back. And already we've got some good questions that are being posted. One was posted in the chat as opposed to the Q&A. Let me start with that one. This is from Chris. Um, and he says, it's not meant in any way to speak ill of his neurologist. I presume it's Chris He, but I do want to pose a question. So he has Scott three, as did his mother, uh, been seeing his neurologist, one who's not an ataxia expert, but has been seeing them for about 10 years. Curious as to whether there's any point in continuing to see my doctor. Each visit seems to be the same. We talk, I describe my encounters and recent falls, and not much more occurs. My doctor has made referrals for speech and swallowing, number of sessions of physical therapy, which have been helpful. Other than that, he's still living with the expected progression and aging that comes along the way. So his question is, would you say there is more that one should expect from a neurologist relationship when there is no cure? Number one, it looks like all the basic rehab bases are being covered that you know appropriate PT referrals, speech and swallowing referrals, which is very important because we all know that, that rehab always helps. It helps you design your home program. It helps you be aware of you know, potential hazards, reduce your risk of falling. And it's good to have a knowledgeable medical partner who can help you with that. Um, if there were symptoms of the general neurologic type, muscle spasms and pain, dizziness, things that can accompany SCA3 and the other ataxias, even a general neurologist is familiar with medications for symptoms. So I think it's good to have you know, an ongoing relationship, even if it's only once a year, so that if a problem does arise, you know, a bladder problem or something that neurological input could be helpful with, you'll have that channel open. But the one thing you don't want to overlook is access to other resources like upcoming clinical trials. Your general neurologist may not be keeping up with trials that are opening up that could be, you know, a good trial for you to participate in. So in that way, I think networking through National Ataxia Foundation, looking at the website where they'll post open trials that are recruiting can sometimes fill in some of the gaps that your general neurologist may not be totally up on. So you have to do some of the work too. Um, but I, I think it's always good to have you know, a neurologic medical partner on your side. So I wouldn't give up that relationship. Now, going back to the Q&A, um, do I have any initial update on Vico's clinical trial? You know, we all know that Vico has started their phase one study for SCA1 and SCA3 um, that they have begun enrolling, and it's going to be looking at safety and dosing. When I asked them how soon they thought they might enlarge into a bigger study, a study looking not just at side effects and dosing, but also at potential good effects, and when they might be applying to the FDA to run the trial in the United States, they said they thought in general next year, um, some of their data timeline suggests it may not be next year, it may be early in the following year. So as they get data, I'm sure there will be press releases that that we can um, you know, benefit from um, and learn from. Any other potential treatments for um, spinal cerebellar ataxia type three that are approaching a clinical trial? Well, we know the Biogen drug was put back on the drawing board because of concerns that at higher dosing, there could be some significant side effects. So that drug hasn't gone away, but it's, it's back to being modified to potentially make it safer to use at lower dose. The CELO study of the infusion of intravenous trehalose, which is a sugar moiety that can get into 
the aggregate protein that's building up in spinal cerebellar ataxia type three, break it up and make it easier for the body to get rid of it. That study was open. It was enrolling. It's currently paused. Um, while they they rearrange, you know, some of the um, you know the, the operational factors, we're hoping that it will reopen for recruitment sometime in the next, you know, before the end of the year. So that's one I'd keep an eye on. Um, but you're right. Currently, there aren't a lot of available clinical trials for any of the spinal cerebellary taxias that are openly recruiting in the United States. Um, the Steminent stem cell trial is still operating only outside the U.S. for SCA2 and SCA3 um, and, and potentially SCA6. Um, they've got, you know, work they've done in Taiwan and in Japan and I believe in South Korea. Um, so I think the upcoming year will hopefully bring more clinical trial opportunities, not just for SCA3, but for the others as well. Now, Colette has a question. Since SCA3 is an inherited disability, do we know if it gets worse with each person um, that gets it in the family line? There are several things that determine how severe the symptoms of any of the ataxias might be. One is the size of the mutation. And with SCA3 and some of the other SCAs that have mutations that are called triplet repeat mutations, when that gene is passed on to the next generation, there's about a 10% chance that the mutation could get bigger, the symptoms could come on earlier and be more severe. So that's only 10% risk in a family line from generation to generation. But there can be other factors that determine you know, severity of symptoms and, and how, how well your body can accommodate them. Lifestyle factors, other medical illnesses, whether you're exercising or not. So, you know, taking care of general health, you know, being aware of, you know, environmental exposures to avoid like too much alcohol um, and, and, you know, taking care of your general rehabilitation status can help stabilize the presentation of any of the scars. Paul has a question. My cerebellar ataxia symptoms began in 2014, so that's not quite 10 years ago, after a bad case of sinusitis, which ended up in the hospital for three weeks. Getting all of his medical paperwork together, he's found an MRI report from 2008, which was before that hospitalization, when he was dealing with back pain. So not exactly clear why they image your brain when you were getting a back pain evaluation. But the MRI stated at that point um, that there was measurable significant cerebellar atrophy. Now, this was before the hospitalization with that severe infection. So something was going on before then that was taking away reserve. And you comment that you didn't have any symptoms until that potential triggering event. So disorders that behave like this are typically genetic, where you've carried a gene mutation for ataxia. Um, and, you know, you've had it since you were born. It slowly starts taking away reserve, but you can still perform without obvious symptoms until you hit you know, a certain level of loss, or there's a triggering event, you know, a major surgical with general anesthesia or a head injury or a severe other illness as the sinusitis that would then, you know, take away the last little vestiges of reserve and allow the symptoms to appear. Um, and then you mention some history of fainting, syncope when, when you were very young. I don't think that's connected to the ataxia. You had Epstein-Barr chronic fatigue when you were 14. If that didn't trigger ataxia symptoms in your teen or early 20s, probably is not considered a triggering factor. Although people who develop Epstein-Barr illness can develop a chronic Epstein-Barr picture that 
often presents with chronic headaches or chronic fatigue syndrome that is ongoing, not necessarily ataxia. So if there isn't a documented genetic factor in your family, perhaps evaluating for a possible underlying infectious inflammatory condition, maybe related to the Epstein-Barr, that could have damaged the cerebellum early on and then led to the later onset of symptoms. One quick way to look for that, there's blood work that can check your immune system, but a spinal tap might show if there's any lingering Epstein-Barr inflammatory things going on that could be behind your cerebellar syndrome. Brianna um, has a question. How common is it to have repeats on multiple SCA genes? Uh, Brianna's daughter tested positive for um, SCA8 and also has repeats on uh, several other genes. Um, for instance, 32 and 30 repeats on a taxon 1, which is just shy of the borderline threshold. So there's two theories going on here. There's two thoughts. There are several families where just by the luck of the draw, they have two ataxia genes running in the family. Some people have one, some people have the other, some people inherited both. Here though, you're talking about repeats in you know, an ostensibly normal range, but on the high end of the range, as you say, just shy of the borderline threshold, so there has been some research done looking at the total burden of repeats. If every one of your ataxia genes has the normal number of repeats, you know, you can add them up and they'll never reach a critical threshold of additive difficulties. But there has been a theory that's been under assessment looking at people who have one clearly mutated gene, but may have larger repeats on other ataxia genes that could add to the burden of the gain of function. So this is an active area of research and I would urge your daughter to get involved with the um, natural history study for spinal cerebellar ataxia where more of this could, could be studied. Hugh has a question. Do I think Rilliazole might slow progression of SCA6? So in the European studies of Rilliazole for ataxia, all kinds of ataxia, genetic ataxia, dominant, recessive, and even non-genetic ataxia, there was a suggestion in one study that it could improve symptoms of ataxia, and in a second study that it might slow progression. But they didn't divide it up into the genetic versus the non-genetic. It was just the ataxia population as a whole. Now, trorilazole, which is Biohaven's research drug, um, which turns into rilazole in your system once you consume it, in two studies that they've published the data on and, and are busy working on the data, you know, hoping to be able to get a, a successful review by the FDA, it did suggest some slowing of progression, some symptomatic benefit slowing of progression, but not particularly for ataxia type 6. In the first study, it was ataxias 1 and 2 that seemed to have some benefit. In the second study, it was ataxia type 3. I think one reason it might have been hard in that study to measure slowing of progression in ataxia type 6 is ataxia type 6 progresses already very slowly at half the speed of the other ataxias. So if there was some slowing of progression, it might take more years of observation to appreciate that. Plus the mechanism of ataxia type six, um, in part is that gain of function, um, you know, toxicity aggregate mechanism that the other ataxias share. But in ataxia type six, there's also a dysfunction in the calcium channels that control the electrical activity of those ataxia pathways. So, you know, you're dealing with two different mechanisms of disease, one of which may be more responsive to Rilliazole, the other one may not be. 
So I think we need to look for better classes of drugs in the pipeline for ataxia type 6 that could address one or the other of its two unique mechanisms. Teddy has a question about hyperbaric oxygen um, and what dose might be effective. Now, hyperbaric oxygen is an accepted treatment for several different things. For you know, a, a, a deep sea diver who's coming up and gets nitrogen bubbles in his system, I think they put them in a hyperbaric chamber, pressure chamber, um, that to try to get rid of the nitrogen and, and restore normal oxygen. For wound healing, higher oxygen concentration can be helpful in pushing back against bacterial infection, improving circulation and oxygen supply to healing um, areas. For ataxia, it's not clear. I don't think that, you know, I'm not going to say no, we have to go back to the literature, but I'm sure there have been published studies about hyperbaric oxygen therapy for genetic disorders, for ataxic disorders, for movement disorders. I am not aware that the evidence is strong enough to warrant committing yourself to that series of treatments. So I'm not going to say any more about that, but I think I will look up some hyperbaric oxygen references just to see what the research has been. I know Dr. Zesowitz at the University of Florida did a review of the literature a few years ago, looking at all the things that had been tried, drug trials and other, you know, uh, other research protocols for exercise, et cetera, and only came up with two things that seemed to have enough evidence to warrant off-label or more common use. One was Riliazole, and one was dalfampridine, a drug that was approved for MS and appears to have some benefit for people with episodic ataxia. So hyperbaric oxygen didn't make the cut in her data review. Steve has a question. First, I want to say, you know, really appreciates, you know, being able to, you know, participate in this forum. Um, and he has a specific question about pain or a constant state of discomfort. He has late onset Friedreichs, now in his eighth year of symptoms, currently taking, uh, and I presume some of this is for pain, 600 milligrams of gabapentin, commonly used for nerve pain, 30 milligrams of baclofen, commonly used for muscle spasm pain, premipexol at a, a modest dose, which is commonly used for the discomfort we associate with restless legs, which can happen in Friedreichs and any of the other ataxias that have neuropathy as a component, and 15 milligrams of meloxicam, which is used for um, you know, garden variety inflammatory muscle soft tissue pain. Um, so that's quite a cocktail and still has perpetual discomfort. Um, now, back in the day, I used to work in our pain clinic, so I'm familiar with the complicated mechanisms that can mediate pain. Um, and I know in Friedreich's, neuromuscular pain, restless legs, very common. So if we think the perpetual discomfort is related to a restless legs phenomenon, the dose of premipexol could be increased. And even though restless legs typically occurs at night, there are people with that discomfort that occurs during the daytime. So they'll take the premipexol spread out over the course of a day. Increasing the meloxicam is probably not going to deal with this unusual pain experience. But if we feel you know, that it's a neurogenic pain, Gabapentin could be used at a higher dose. Baclofen could be used at a higher dose. Um, there are also non-drug pain strategies. Um, physical therapy may have pain relieving techniques, ultrasound, um, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, deep tissue massage. Um, and if you haven't tried any of the non-drug strategies, they probably are worth trying to see if they would help a little bit. Medical hypnosis has been used for chronic pain from a variety of sources, and it, it does work. It alters the way your brain perceives the pain. The pain signals might still be there, 
but medical hypnosis, which actually works through pathways that are mediated by endorphins, um, which is where narcotics work, um, you know, you can modify your endorphin pathways with medical hypnosis, biofeedback, other psychological techniques. Um, so I don't think you need to learn to live with this. Chronic discomfort is distracting. It, it definitely takes a big bite out of your quality of life. So I would explore some non-drug strategies, some physical therapy strategies you may not have tried yet, potentially increasing gabapentin, increasing baclofen, or using the pramipexol in a, in a wider way. Kelton has a question, is there a value in genetic testing? Um, so, boy, there are several aspects there that, that we should discuss. First of all, I, we had a wonderful grand rounds this morning um, at UCLA about the advances that have been made in genetic testing. Um, back from the day when the very first ataxia genetic test was, was developed and was available commercially to now where we have access to whole exome sequencing, genome sequencing, multiple tests for you know, triplet repeat expansion disorders like the spinocerebellar ataxias. So, um, you know, we've made a lot of progress, but you know, you're pointing out here that you got the test for SCA5 eight years ago. Eight years ago, the bill came back for $10,000. So you wonder if that was for a single gene test or if they just did a panel where they screened eight years ago and Athena Diagnostics had a panel eight years ago that looked at all the known ataxia genes at the time um, dominant and recessive, you know, SCA5 is a dominant one. Um, and the cost was around $10,000. And when whole exome sequencing, you know, the medical version of 23andMe, you know, became available, screening for even rarer ataxia genes, the cost could run, you know, upwards of $8,000, very close to that. So you had to fight with insurance to get them to cover it. Uh, it was negative. So it seems that you know, if they sent a single gene test and it cost you $10,000, that's unreasonable. I suspect they sent a panel. Um, you were looking for SCA5, um, which I, I don't know why it was decided to look for that one in you particularly, um, but it came back negative. And it didn't seem worthwhile to go on a fishing expedition when there's probably nothing actionable that can come of it. So. Um, Currently, there are things you can do with a positive gene test. Um, number one, you can counsel other family members. Number two, if you know the mechanism of action of that gene, you might be able to design treatments that could specifically make up for that problem or become involved in targeted research, not just general natural history research or biomarker research, but there will be pipelines for all of the commonly identified ataxias. Um, if you go to the NAF website, you'll see they have beautiful drawn out pipelines, which are a little, a little bare in some cases right now, but will be growing for the common ataxias where there are drugs in development that will come into clinical trials that if you are positive for one of those gene tests, you can participate in it. So you're right, a fishing expedition is a concern. It would be important to find out what they actually tested for for ten thousand dollars. And if you did want to move forward with, you know, additional testing for some of the newer genetic factors, certainly if you have a positive family history, it's worth to consider looking for that. Um, because with the available genetic testing in undiagnosed families, we have about a seventy percent chance of finding a genetic factor that is the one that is running in your family. If you don't have um, a family history, there's a, you know, maybe a 20% chance a genetic factor could be found, um, but you'd have to decide which type of genetic testing to do, and you'd have to try to get authorization from your insurance. Um, and you're right, the insurers uh, umpteen years ago were hesitant to cover any genetic testing, 
um, because there was nothing you could do. But now there are things in the pipeline that I think will offer opportunities. So don't give up on it yet. Now, Marija, um, you know, her son is um, nine years old and has SCA 13. Um, this is, you know, not, not one of the common ataxias. So, um, you know, it's, it's rare, has problems with concentration and fatigue. Uh, for example, he spends about four hours at school, is very tired and unfocused afterwards. Um, parents have to repeat to him several times to do ordinary activities, you know, remind him constantly to wash his hands, not to walk around when getting dressed because that's dangerous. What can I recommend? Are there any therapies or supplements that can improve his condition? So fatigue, which can alter concentration and can really impair activities of daily living is very common in all the ataxias. Patients with fatigability benefit from two different, well, three different approaches. Um, a, a general non-fatiguing exercise program that is done daily can help build up reserve and help with endurance and reduce fatigability. So that's one thing we'd want to make sure that, that he's participating in. Number two, some of the antioxidant vitamins, although they haven't been that effective at you know, free radical scavenging and protecting nerves from genetic stress, they have been helpful for fatigue. So you might consider a trial of low-dose CoQ10 as an example. Um, third, there are anti-fatigue agents that can be used in adults. Um, and, you know, in kids, drugs that are stimulants for adults you know, may, may have a calming effect in children. Think of drugs for, um, you know, uh, ADHD, for instance. You know, that family of drugs is used in kids to help, you know, improve concentration when there's hyperactivity, but in used in adults, they're actually stimulants. So I would have a discussion with your pediatrician about whether a prescription drug would be appropriate for at least a short-term trial. But you also wanna make sure that there's not something else going on. Is he sleeping well? You know, disrupted sleep at night for a nine-year-old can really impair performance the next day. So make sure that nighttime sleep is restful, um, that he's getting enough hours of sleep. Um, and then a final area, you know, with young people, you know, especially teenagers, but even a nine-year-old, um, problems with concentration, fatigue, um, distracted behavior, could be a sign of depression. And that should also be looked at. You don't want to overlook a depression that, that could be treated very effectively and, and could open, you know, open, you know, uh, turn the lights on for, for this young man. Anne has a question. Does acute cerebellar ataxia have ADHD tendencies? Now, I'm not sure what you mean by acute cerebellar ataxia. Um, but there are, I mean, acute ataxia usually isn't going to cause ADHD. It's, you know, could be quite disabling if it's sudden onset. Um, but we do know that cerebellar involvement, whether it's acute or chronic, can itself alter concentration, um, you know, ability to focus, you know, difficulties with speed of memory and thinking can alter mood. And this goes back to that nine-year-old, you know, thinking that there's a cerebellar issue that could be behind some of his, you know, behavioral issues. But um, if the cerebellar ataxia in, in this case is contributing to some behavioral or emotional changes, they do respond to treatment. So, you know, don't just write it off to your ataxia, but actually seek some treatment that might settle those ADHD tendencies and improve your, your quality of life and daily performance. Elise has a question. Any update on OMAV for children? Um, the, um, you know, Riata has been uh, acquired and, and OMAV, Scott Claris, has been acquired by Biogen. There are plans for um, an, an official phase two type study to look at 
you know, dosing side effects, long-term benefits in younger children. But there is currently soon to start a phase one study, which will be done, um, I believe, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, it's interesting. It was posted on clinicaltrials.gov, but they weren't quite ready to, to initiate it because of the change in hands of the drug from Riata to, to Biogen. But that phase one study to establish some basic dosing um, and side effect parameters will hopefully be kicking off in the, in the next month or two. And then next year, we should have a longer term study that will recruit um, you know, people from you know, more than just one site. Now, I know that in the Friedreichs community, um, there are some children under age 16 who have been able to get the drug prescribed by their local neurologists and get it approved by their insurance and get it dispensed from the biologic central pharmacy. Three big hurdles for off-label use of an adult drug in children. Will your doctor prescribe it? Will your insurance authorize it? Will the pharmacy you know, dispense it? So apparently they're getting it. And I think there will be some data from, you know, the parents of those youngsters about how the children are doing relative to side effects. And they're going to be taking an adult dose that may be too much for a kid. So we have to, we have to really look at safety first. Any promising studies for cardiomyopathy for kids? So Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has spearheaded for the last few years and, and the group at Cornell um, more detailed natural history data collection about cardiomyopathy in FA kids. This is going to be important because any of the treatments for cardiomyopathy, obviously the earlier you start them, the better the long-term benefits will be because the cardiomyopathy is life-threatening. Um, but there's currently no way to predict who of the younger patients who have onset of their Friedreichs with neurologic features are going to be at greatest risk for the cardiomyopathy that can be so devastating, you know, in even in their teens or 20s. Um, and there are studies going on now, which on the FARA website, they do list them that, you know, will hope give us more information about that. Um, okay, so Ace Roberts, is anyone else experiencing 10 to 15 second seizures? Ah, seizures. Are we sure that they're seizures? Um, or are they just episodes of ataxia or episodes of dizziness? If they are true seizures, there you know, are very few documented genetic ataxias that can include epileptic seizures. Um, those can be diagnosed, they can be treated. But on the other hand, other episodic features that may be interpreted as seizure-like, episodic dizziness and vertigo, episodic ataxia, where all of a sudden you'll go from being reasonably balanced to being staggering and unable to stand up. So I, it's not clear what you're referring to there. There are a group of ataxias that have episodic features, um, that, you know, can be treated with medications like dalfampridine and other medications. So, you know, we, we should probably better define what, um, what these seizures are. Teresa, any recent updates and treatments for SCOT2? Um, there are one or two drug companies that are currently preclinical um, drug development specifically for SCOT2. Um, so they're not yet ready for human trials. Um, but, you know, I think they could be added to the pipeline um, as preclinical, and hopefully over the upcoming year, um, you know, we will be able to have, um, you know, phase one trials of new, new drugs in development for SCOT2. Um, Daniel, what syndromes are related to Friedreich's ataxia? Okay, so syndromes. Well, you know, Friedreich's ataxia is not just a neurologic disease. Um, it involves the nervous system, the spinal long nerves, which control coordination, control, you know, muscle tone and reflexes, control sensation in, in the legs and, and ultimately the hands, you know, may have an impact on speech as well, speech and swallowing, all neurologic features. And in some patients with Friedreichs, there can be changes in vision 
and hearing. Then there are orthopedic syndromes, which are closely related to the neurologic developmental syndromes, whereas you know, the muscles and nerves direct them so the bones grow, hence scoliosis, high arches, hammer toes, foot deformities. Then there are the purely medical um, aspects, you know, the, the heart-related problems that we've just talked about, where there could be changes in heart rhythm, changes in heart performance. Um, then there are um, the risk of diabetes because of involvement of the pancreas. There's felt to be some related increased risk of um, inflammatory bowel disease. You know, there was, you know, a study done through the natural history database and there seemed to be an increased incidence of inflammatory bowel disease in patients with Friedreichs. Um, we know that there can be garden variety GI tract changes, constipation, um, GI motility issues, um, gastroparesis where the stomach doesn't empty properly. There can be problems with bladder muscle and the bowel, you know, GI tract and bladder muscles are different from our, our regular muscles, different from heart muscles, um, so that there can be bladder involvement. So in looking at, you know, the various symptomatic syndromes that can present, you know, there, you know, are many, many things that are under the umbrella of somebody's with Friedreich's ataxia. Um, and if you were asking a different question than the one I answered, I, I apologize. Um, there are things not associated with Friedreich's. You know, there isn't an increased risk of cancer. There isn't an increased risk of immune deficiency that we see in some of the other pediatric ataxias. Olivia, is there a best medicine for tremors? There are standard medicines for tremors that have been used for, for generations. Um, the most common one is um, propranolol, a beta blocker that's been used for heart and for blood pressure problems. And it can work very quickly to calm down um, an action tremor that you know, may come from the cerebellum. Um, if that doesn't work, the next choice is usually a drug called primidone, which is in the phenobarbital family. And it seems to have a very specific effect for tremors. At higher dose, it's, it's obviously used for epilepsy. Um, and then there are some second and third line drugs for tremor. So depending on where the tremor is and how severe it is and what kind of tremor, some specific types of tremor respond to drugs that are used in Parkinson's disease that really is quite distant in its triggering um, area from the cerebellum. Um, there are drugs in the Valium family. I think a common one is clonazepam, which can be used for certain types of cerebellar tremor, myoclonic tremors as an example. Um, you can also use various physical therapy interventions, um, you know, for eating, you know, weighted utensils, a heavy cup, a heavy fork, a heavy spoon can reduce the interference of tremor. There are actually eating utensils that are designed, um, you know, to be easily used by people with tremor. So that even if your hand is shaking, the spoon stays level. Um, wrist weights can sometimes suppress a tremor. So there's a lot of interventions, including more severe ones, deep brain stimulation, you know, which has been in use for Parkinson's tremor and other types of tremor, but it's always better to work with non-invasive strategies first. Lisa has a question. Is there any medication for dizziness after all these years? Okay, the list of medications for dizziness, if you go to the National Taxi Foundation website, they have a, a little handout that talks about symptomatic medications. And, and the list of ones that can be used for dizziness probably has about 20 entries on it. And I have patients who have tried every one of them and none of them work. I think for dizziness, you can either usually start with something like the drugs used for seasickness, which calm down the inner ear so there's less stimulation going to the balance center. And that can reduce the sense of dizziness can also make you drowsy, which may not be good for your ataxia. Um, some of the anti-seizure drugs that are 
in use for things other than seizures. Gabapentin, we've already talked about its use for pain, may have benefit for dizziness used at modest dose. Um, Dalfampridine, the drug that we had mentioned for episodic ataxia, may calm down one of the central dizzy pathways. So I would you know, suggest discuss it with your doctor, go to the National Ataxia Foundation website, look at the list, check off the ones you've already tried. And if there are ones you haven't tried, um, discuss it with your physician. Danny, have you heard of SCA 43? Well, they're up to SCA 50. So I, I think we've probably all heard of SCA 43. Um, and, you know, that is the best guess of the diagnosis from, you know, DNA testing. So it sounds like you've had um, some DNA testing that showed some change in the gene associated with SCA43. And I'm going to have to go back and look it up, find out what that gene is and what the reported mutations are. But you're right. Sometimes the genetic testing will show an obvious mutation that is known to disable that gene. But sometimes it'll show a small change in a gene that hasn't been 100% correlated with ataxia symptoms. And that's where involvement in the research, you know, working with a doctor who's going to keep up with the research, you know, giving a DNA sample for some of the genetic testing that's going on, looking at new ataxia genes, looking for new mutations can help answer some of those questions. Art has a question. Do you see many SCA6 patients with orthostatic hypotension? Or what about an overactive bladder? Now, both of those are from the autonomic nervous system that you know acts without our voluntary participation in maintaining blood pressure, controlling our bowels and bladder, controlling our heart rhythm. Um, so the things that we don't have to think about, but that there are nerve pathways that control them. I have had one or two patients with SCA6 with some unstable blood pressure. I've had more patients with SCA6 who have an overactive bladder that probably comes from incoordination of some of the voluntary muscles involved in bladder support and bladder control. So autonomic changes in SCA6 are unusual, but they have been reported. And then remember that SCA6 tends to occur in older patients over the age of 50, where some of these autonomic changes may just come with the aging process. So here's an anonymous attendee interested in ataxia and sleep. Oh, there are plenty of research patients, papers that can be found. And what you might try doing is Googling ataxia and sleep because the Google search will highlight not just, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, people trying to sell you medication for ataxia and sleep, but it will highlight some of the research articles that have been published through the National Library of Medicine. Um, as a practitioner, I have actually, you know, through my institution, access to PubMed, which is from the National Library of Medicine. I don't know about your access as a non-medical practitioner, but if you ask your physician um, if they have access to that um, research database, they can directly pull down more articles. But Googling, you know, you'll actually come up with some, some research articles and hopefully some review articles. Um, or I could send, you know, a list of, you know, some of, you know, the articles that, that I have um, in, in my repository I can send it to um, to Lori, and you know, given that you're an anonymous attendee, I'm not sure you know how you would connect with her, but you know, you can try contacting her and see if I've, I've actually sent that list. So iPhone 139. If your cerebellum is littler or damaged, can it ever grow back or heal from damage? It's, you know, nerves that have been lost are not going to grow back with our current technology work with stem cells, work with nerve growth factors, 
you know, is looking at healing cerebellar damage or spinal cord damage, I think is where much of, you know, much of that research is going on damage from stroke. So there, there are drugs that are being studied and treatments being studied. However, even with some mild cerebellar atrophy or damage, you do have reserve that can be drawn on to reconnect. So think of somebody who's had a stroke, you know, with good, uh, you know, with aggressive physical therapy, they can actually bring in new connections from the undamaged areas that will take over from the damaged areas. So the same thing with the cerebellum, with aggressive physical therapy and home exercise programs, you can draw on and build that reserve. Sean, um, what solutions do you recommend to treat spasticity? You currently take baclofen, but what, you know, prefer to reduce the um, need for medication. Okay, so non-drug strategies um, for spasticity. You're right, baclofen is the oldest and most commonly used one. Dalfampridine, an ataxia drug that we've already mentioned, may have some impact on spasticity. Um, dantrolene, tizanidine. So there are a number of drugs. Valium can be used for severe spasticity. Physical therapy probably has strategies for stretching, um, for muscle stimulation that can help um, reduce spasticity. Um, stretching is probably very effective at reducing the nerve signals that trigger spasticity. So a good stretch program should be able to reduce your need for medication. Um, electrical stimulation, um, we've talked about transcutaneous electrical stimulation, you know, where they put electrodes on your skin. I don't know that, you know, the surface electrodes will reduce spasticity. Um, Botox injections, into the spastic muscles can help relax them, but could make them weak. Spinal stimulators have been used as well as spinal drug pumps to pump baclofen at lower dose directly into the spinal column. All of these are ways to treat spasticity. But you know, the least invasive is probably going to be physical therapy interventions, um, you know, and then possibly you know, if, if you don't want to be taking a daily medication, consider some Botox. Um, and really only at the extremes of spasticity do we look at spinal pumps and, and spinal stimulators. Shirley, um, David Price's mother, um, he passed away in his sleep at the age of 33 in 2001. I vividly remember David and, and you and working with your family I don't know what caused his death, but I can look that up. We should have some record in our older notes. Um, and I will get back to you about that, possibly through the NAF, but I may still have your active contact information. Um, passing away in your sleep with ataxia is usually due to some type of central sleep apnea where your, you know, the breathing center in your brain stem that's supposed to keep going while you're asleep just stops working because of brain stem progression of your ataxia. But another complication could be in some types of ataxia, there are changes in heart rhythm and patients may develop a rhythm problem during sleep that stops their heart. Um, and I've seen this happen in, in patients with a, a number of different types of ataxia, but you know, surely I, I will get back to you. Carrie, can a non-affected carrier have symptoms such as not being able to ski, but can ride a bike? Um, non-affected carriers, if it's a recessive disorder like Friedreich's, um, typically carriers have no symptoms, they have no motor problems, they have no medical issues, for instance. Um, but there are um, some people who, for whatever the reason, could never learn to ride a bike, but are able to do other things where they're standing on two feet. So you think about it, when you're riding a bike, it's all your core and core balance and stability. While when you're skiing or dancing or roller skating, You've got two feet on the ground, which is a different approach to um, balance and coordination. 
But if you're a carrier of a recessive disease, it is not contributing to that symptom discrepancy that you have noticed. Cheryl, I'm getting IVIG treatments every three weeks. Sounds like this is being given for an identified um, immune problem where there's a bad antibody that has been found. I'm still experiencing balance and disequilibrium problems. Would more frequent infusions be helpful? Um, typically, IVIG is not given more frequently than every three to four weeks. I have one patient who's getting it every two weeks and felt that it would definitely work better. Um, so the question is, immediately after a treatment, do you get some relief that may last a week and then begins to decline? That could be a sign that you might need more frequent infusions or a different approach to what may be a bad antibody syndrome. On the other hand, if the IVIG treatments don't do anything for your balance and disequilibrium, you know, maybe IVIG is not hitting the point that needs to be addressed in your ataxia. Linda, um, you know, oh, family with 27B, that's one of the newest discovered ataxia genes. Looking at the genetic testing and are there other tests that can be done? Um, Currently, there's only one lab in the country that tests for Scott 27B, and that's the University of Chicago. Um, so if you are specifically seeking out that test, you either have to go to Chicago or your local hospital lab has to have a relationship with the University of Chicago to send samples to them. UCLA lab currently does not have that relationship. We did at the beginning of the year, something happened with a reorganization between the two labs. Currently, we can't send samples to University of Chicago for 27B testing, which is frustrating to say the least. Um, so it looks like um, at-risk family members, um, you know, may have had MRIs, you know, which could show some changes that would indicate that, you know, that, that gene problem has been there for, for a while. Um, genetic testing availability is going to depend on your institution or whether you live in Chicago. Um, are there other tests that can be done? One interesting test for Scott 27B ataxia in people who have symptoms is they seem to have a very good response to dalfampridine. That was the drug that we mentioned previously for episodic ataxia. So one way to document that, yeah, it's suggestive, it's in my family, I have ataxia, maybe my MRI shows some, you know, some changes, um, is a trial of dalfampridine. And if you benefit from it, um, you know, it could be a sign that, yeah, you've got that 27B gene, and you know you you're you're using a treatment that you know people are accepting has has been very um very effective now i'm going to skip to the middle of the group because we've had a lot of questions here and i've been only sticking with the first ones which isn't really fair um so let me go down to um pauline another question about 27b um now, she is taking dalfampridine um, and chlorzoxazone, which, you know, there's been some research suggesting it may have a neuroprotective effect, but not seeing any benefit, which is unusual for 27B. As I said, you know, you know, it's almost diagnostic. You know, you start dalfampridine and, and, and there's an obvious response. Now, one problem with dalfampridine as a prescription drug, it's time release. And the immediate release is only available through compounding pharmacies at this point. So it's possible you would get a better response with um, the immediate release formulation of dalfampridine through a compounding pharmacy. Um, the, um, now, the, the chlorzoxazone, you know, I'm not so sure would be of benefit. And then you had a question about, um, you know, acetazolamide, uh, which has been used for episodic ataxia. It's used variably 
you know, for, you know, conditions that might respond to dalfampradine, might respond to acetazolamide. It hasn't been documented to be a benefit for 27B yet at this, at this time. Now, Sally also has a question interested in sleep disorders asking, you know, so I'm wondering if Sally was the anonymous person that had asked the original question. So I'm going to make sure that when I go back to my, you know, repository of articles that I can direct um, NAF to be in touch with you and, and we can get those things to you. And then we here, here have an, another anonymous uh, attendee. When people say I have cerebellar ataxia, isn't that the same thing as saying I have ataxia? I thought all ataxias are cerebellar. They are not. You can have ataxia symptoms from problems with the signals going into the cerebellum. The cerebellum could be fine, but if it's getting the wrong input, you know, it's, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So if your sensory pathways bringing in sensory information to the cerebellum are defective, as they are early on in Friedreich's, they can cause ataxia in the face of a, basically a normal cerebellum. The inner ear signals, if they're not getting in properly, you can have disequilibrium, which can lead to ataxia. So you always want to sort out, is the cerebellum the problem or is it one of the input pathways that's the problem? Daryl has a question. Um, he's a Scott 7 patient and there's been very good research going on in Scott 7 to develop uh, a better understanding of you know, the eye symptoms and some of the other symptoms to develop a better understanding of the gene itself and how it can influence you know, vision pathways versus influencing the cerebellum. And also there has been a pipeline for development of gene blocking drugs. These are the ASOs that, that we've all heard about, antisense oligonucleotides. Ionis Pharma has been working on that. Um, the NIH has a special dedicated research group for SCOS-7, and I would suggest that you get involved with one of the natural history research groups um, so that you can you know, take part in any advances in, in research. And I think we have time for at least one more question um, about SCOT-2. We actually have two questions from Sion about SCOT-2. A uh, good question. Are there seminars coming up in relation to Scott too? You know, we'll we'll ask the NIF to set that up. You know, Sion's mother has Scott too. Uh, she's been diagnosed with stage four non-small cell lung cancer, metastatic spread to areas on bone and small lesions in the brain. She's done two cycles of chemo, immune, two more to go, decided against radiation. What are the effects of chemo and immune therapy on Scott too? Um, chemo immune therapy can affect peripheral nerves. Some of the therapies may affect the brain itself, so that if you're dealing with both cancer treatment and a genetic ataxia, um, you know, the odds are good that the cancer treatment is going to add some disability to, to the SCA2, unfortunately. So I think we'll we'll you know we'll we'll call it quits for now. And I apologize for not being able to get through more questions, but you know, it's just the responses are, are so intriguing and so good. And, and I thank everybody for, for participating in, in these wonderful sessions. Yes, this was another great session and everyone has asked such great questions. So thank you all for joining and thank you, Dr. Perlman for being here to answer so many of our questions today. For those of you that want to go back and listen again to any of uh, the answers that was shared here today, this session is being recorded and will be in, available on our website within the next week. And we look forward to seeing everybody at the next session. Take care, everyone. Till next time. <laughs>